morning and welcome. Before we begin the service and do the intimations and so on, there's a prayer that came from the moderator of the cup, Shaw Patterson, as a suggested prayer for this morning as we remember the anniversary of the events leading to the war in the Middle East. So just let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord God, you have commanded us to love our neighbour, and yet we have failed. Lord God, you have commanded us to love one another, and yet we have allowed hatred to grow in strength. Lord God, you have commanded us to follow the example of Christ, and yet we have become motionless and silent. Lord God, you have commanded us to reach out beyond every human made barrier, and yet we have closed our senses to the problems that exist in our world. Help us to turn the word peace into a verb that we become active in seeking opportunities for dialogue and meaningful discussion as a means to identify a path to peace for all people in Israel and Gaza. Almighty God, as we note the significant anniversary, we pray for an end to the war on Gaza and for, just, for a just resolution for all the people of Israel. We condemn all acts of violence and atrocities and pray that every individual may live free from the horror still being endured. May this anniversary be an opportunity to step back from further escalation as we see it unfolding in the Middle East. And may we work together for peace and justice for all. We remember all those who endure continued trauma and distress, those suffering physical and emotional injury, and those who have been bereaved. Give to them your comfort and enable them to know that they are surrounded by your love. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. This is from Psalm 39 and verse 1. I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth as long as the wicked are in my presence. But the muzzle will still allow me to sing. So we will sing hymn 465. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me safe that thou art, thou my best thought, in day or in night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Number 465.
Let's come to our God. Let's pray. Almighty and all loving God, in awe and reverence, we come to worship you, to proclaim your greatness, to acknowledge your power, and to recognize your sovereignty, to declare your goodness. Lord of all, hear our prayer. Compassionate and caring God, with grateful hearts, we come to praise you for your love that constantly surrounds us, for all the blessings of our lives, for the wonder of our world, for the hope of our faith in Christ. Merciful and forgiving God, in sorrow and shame we come before you to confess our unworthiness of your goodness, to confess we have not loved you or one another as we should, to confess we have failed to appreciate your many gifts and broken your commandments. Living a life-giving God, in faith and trust we come to petition you to pray for ourselves, for one another and for our world, to bring the concerns of daily life before you to lift our loved ones into your presence, to commit the affairs of our world into your hands. Lord of all, we offer you this time of worship, our praise, our thanksgiving, our confession, our petition. Lord of all, hear our prayers. Respond to us, we pray. Touch our hearts with your living presence and fill our lives with your grace so that our love for you may grow, our faith may be deepened and our service strengthened. Lord of all, hear our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, honour and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Uh, I'm John. I'm privileged today to be in front of you, giving you all the thanks for you took me as a child and you have given me a good channel in this church. It, had been, it would be a very tough journey if it was not for you people. I thank you. We may be leaving next week on Thursday, that will be on the 24th. I shall be having a flight of around 18 hours to Kenya. And I thank God for that far. I give you all the glory and I thank you all of you. In Kenya, there is a song we sing. I will sing it and then I will interpret for you of what it says. <laughs> This word uh, 
Um, it's from the book of Luke, chapter 9, verses 24. Um, um, it says, I mean, Luke 9, verse 5. And these were the words of Jesus saying to the disciples, Wherever you are welcome, stay in the same house until you leave that town. That same word is in Mark chapter 6, verse, um, verse 10. Mark 6, 10. He also told them, Wherever you are welcome, stay in the same house until you leave that place. So, as the disciples were sent out, and they went to proclaim the gospel of God. They were told, wherever you will come, stay until you leave the same town. And, uh, and for me, where I was welcome, I stayed until my last day. May God be with you, may he, may he remain with you. You will be back here after six months, we shall come back. Thank you. Facing you lot, even on a Sunday morning, it's not easy. <laughs> well done. <coughs> now we're going to sing again in hymn number 180. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. Number 180. Then 10 to 15. This can be found on and around page 
889 of the Pure Bible. Amos chapter 5, verse 6. Go to the Lord, and you will live. If you do not go, he will sweep down like fire on the people of Israel. The fire will burn up the people of Bethel, and no one will be able to put it out. You are doomed, you that twist justice and cheat people out of their rights. You people hate anyone who challenges injustice and speaks the whole truth in court. You have oppressed the poor and robbed them of their grain, and so you will not live in the fine stone houses you build or drink wine from the beautiful vineyards you plant. I know how terrible your sins are and how many crimes you have committed. You persecute good men, take bribes, and prevent the poor from getting justice in the courts. And so keeping quiet in such evil times. Is this the clever thing to do? Make it your aim to do what is right, not what is evil, so that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty really will be with you, as you claim he is. Hate what is evil. Love what is right. And see that justice prevails in the courts. Perhaps the Lord will be merciful to the people of this nation who are still left alive.
Testament reading is taken from the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 10, verse 17 to 31. This can be found on and around page 60 of the True Bible. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. As Jesus was starting on his way again, a man ran up, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to receive eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not accuse anyone falsely. Do not cheat. Respect your father and mother. Teacher, the man said, ever since I was young, I have obeyed all these commandments. Jesus looked straight at him with love and said, You need only one thing. Go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor and you will have riches in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the man heard this, gloom spread over his face and he went away sad because he was very rich. Jesus looked round at his disciples and said to them, How hard it would be for rich people to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were shocked at these words. But Jesus went on to say, My children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is much harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. At this, the disciples were completely amazed and asked one another, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked straight at them and answered, This is impossible for man, but not for God. Everything is possible for God. Then Peter spoke up, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Yes, Jesus said to them, and I tell you that anyone who leaves home, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or fields for me, and for the gospel, will receive much more in this present age. He will receive a hundred times more houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and persecutions as well. And in the age to come, he will receive eternal life. But many who now are first will be last, and many who now are last will be first. May God add his blessing to this, the reading of his holy word, and to his name be the praise and glory, now and forevermore. Amen. This is surely one of the most vivid stories in the Gospels. But we have to note how the man came and how Jesus met him. Because this man came running and he flung himself at the feet of Jesus. And there's surely something amazing in the sight of this rich young aristocrat falling at the feet of the penniless prophet from Nazareth, who was well on the way to being seen as an outlaw by the Jewish leaders. Good teacher, he began, and straight away Jesus answered back, No flattery, do not call me good, keep that word for God. It's almost as if he was trying to, almost to freeze him out, and to pour cold water, certainly, on his young enthusiast. But there's a lesson here. It's also clear that this man came to Jesus in a moment of high, overflowing almost, emotion. And it's clear also that Jesus exercised a personal fascination over him. And Jesus then did two things that every evangelist and every pre preacher and every teacher ought to remember and to copy. First, 
Jesus in, in effect is saying stop and think about what you're saying, what you're doing. You're all wrought up and palpitating with emotion. Calm down because I don't want you swept to me by a moment of emotion. Think calmly what you're doing. This was Jesus telling him right from the beginning that whatever this decision was, it was going to be costly. And secondly, Jesus is also saying, you cannot become a Christian by being drawn only to me. You have to look to God. Preaching and teaching always means the conveying of truth through personality, and that's where the greatest danger for the greatest teachers lies. The danger is that the pupil, the scholar or the member form a personal attachment to the teacher or preacher and think that it's absolutely an attachment with God. The teacher or preacher must always point to God. Never did any story lay down the essential Christian truth that respectability is not actually enough. Jesus quoted the commandments which were the basis of, a de of the decent, respectable life that everyone tried to live. Without hesitation, this young man said, but I've kept all those. I've done all that. I haven't robbed anybody. I've been good. With one exception, all of these commandments that this young man had kept and which we are all supposed to keep are all negative commandments. There's one exception and that was the one that operated only in the family circle. So really the man was saying as most of us would say, I never did anyone any harm. And that was perfectly true. But then the real question for him and for us is what good have you done to people? And the question to this young man was even more pointed. For it was, with all your possessions, with all your great wealth, with all that you could give away, what positive good have you really done? How much have you gone out of your way to help and comfort and strengthen others as you might have done? Respectability on the whole consists of not doing things. Christianity consists in doing things. That's the difference. And that was precisely where this man and so many of us, I suspect, fall down. We're very good at not doing things. How good are we at doing things? Jesus confronted this man with a challenge because in effect he's saying get out of this moral respectability. Stop looking at goodness as consisting of not doing things and take yourself, take all you have and spend yourself and your possessions on others. Then you will find true happiness in time and in eternity. And this young man just couldn't do it. But then again, can we? He had great possessions, but it had never entered his head to give them away. And when it was suggested to him, he definitely couldn't do it. And I suggest that, that we are in the same boat. If we actually had to give up our possessions and go out and give them money away and do things for people, 
How many of us would do it? It was true. He had never stolen or defrauded anyone, and I wouldn't suggest anyone in here has done that either. But neither had he ever been, nor could he compel himself to be, positively and sacrificially generous. A thought to take away with you today. How can I be sacrificially generous? It may be respectable never to take anything from anyone, but it's Christian to give everything to someone. It's the difference. In reality, Jesus was confronting this man with a basic and essential question. How much, how much do you really want to be a real Christian? Do you want it enough to give everything away? And the man had to answer the effect, I want it. I do want it, but I do not want it as much as all that. It was this not wanting enough which meant tragedy for this young man as he came to Jesus and seemed to be rejected. Sadly, we all want goodness, but so few of us want it enough to pay the full price. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. We're told that in Scripture. But there were many things, many aspects in that look of Jesus. There was the appeal of love. Jesus was not angry with him. He loved him too much for that. So it wasn't a look of anger, but a look of the appeal of love. Then there was the challenge to chivalry. It was a look which sought to pull the man out of his comfort zone into the adventure of being a real Christian. It was the look of grief. That grief was the grief that is the sorest grief of all. The grief of seeing a person deliberately choose to fail to be what they might have been and who had it in them, who have it in them, to do just that. Jesus looks at us with the appeal of love, with the challenge to the nightliness of the Christian way. God grant that he may never have to look at us with the sorrow of one who looks at a loved one who refuses to be what they might have been and could have been. What kind of look would you expect to receive? I know the one I expect to receive, and it's not the good one. We have always been told that coming to church, being part of the church, Fellowship. That's all you need. But it's not all we need. You need to believe and you need to go out and show it. Because sitting huddled in here is nice. It's warm in here. Which is good. I hate to think you're all sitting there freezing. But that's not what we're meant to be doing. This should be our powerhouse. Powerhouse of prayer, prayer house, a powerhouse of planning. And then we should open that door and flood out into the streets to bring folk, yes, bring them to church, but bring them to Christ. That is our purpose in life if we are, as we claim to be, Christians.
We are not asked to sit in the pews or to stand in the pews and sing in our tradition. It's not what it's about. I enjoy it. That was evident last Sunday night. I like to sing hymns and I like to talk about hymns. But that's not what the what Jesus is actually asking. He's asking us to follow him, to follow him into the streets and convince other people of him and what he came to stand for and what we need to be believing in. It's very easy, I think, to be an awfully nice quiet person who goes to church on a Sunday morning. But when you meet somebody on a Wednesday afternoon and they want to know why you go to church on a Sunday morning, that's when you can't be quiet. You have to speak up and you have to speak out and you have to say what it is you believe. And I have to ask, as I ask every congregation, how many of us are prepared to speak out to be seen to be following Jesus because it's awfully easy to put a pretense on that now I'll leave you to think about that and we'll sing hymn number 533 I think yes will you come and follow me if I but call your name will you go where you don't know and never be the same Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and in me? Number 533.
Let's pray. Loving God, so often we fail to thank you for all we have received. We are quick to ask for more, but slow to appreciate what we have already received. We are quick to bring our requests, but so slow to show gratitude when they are granted. We are quick to complain when life is hard, but slow to rejoice when it is good. Loving God, forgive us and receive now these gifts offered to you as our way of saying what we should have said so many times before. Thank you for everything. Lord Jesus Christ, you call us as you called your first disciples to follow you, not simply to believe, not merely to declare our faith and confess you as Lord, but to keep on following wherever you lead. Help us to follow you eagerly, faithfully, devotedly, seeing where you are at work and staying close to us. Help us to follow in your footsteps, pursuing the way of love and accepting the road of sacrifice. Help us to follow after you, letting your presence fill our hearts and trusting you so completely that your love shines through us. Help us to follow through the life of discipleship, not allowing ourselves to become distracted or to lose heart so that we wander away from you, but keeping faith to the end. Lord Jesus, help us. Lord Jesus Christ, you call us, as you call all your people, to follow you. Teach us what that means, and by your love, help us to respond and to be followers of your way. Lord Jesus, help us, for we ask it in your name. Living God, we pray for those people who have lost hope in their dreams, their circumstances, or even in life itself. We pray for those who have lost the hope of finding a partner or of raising a family, the hope of going to college, university, or further studies, the hope of finding a home or any permanent roof over their heads, the hope of securing employment, or a use for their skills. We pray for those who despair of seeing freedom, justice, peace, or reconciliation. Those who despair of finding adequate food and clothing. Those who despair of receiving help and healing. We pray for those who have given up on life those with terminal illness who have lost the will to keep on fighting, those whose spirits have been crushed so they can no longer bounce back, those who want to take their own lives because they've lost all hope, those so afflicted by starvation and disease that they cannot carry on. Lord of all hopefulness, hear our prayer. Living God, there is so much despair in our world, and for many there seems little reason to hope. Reach out, we pray, to all those whose belief in the future has been destroyed, and grant new dreams where the old ones have died. Rekindle purpose where confidence has been undermined. Support when there seems to be nothing left to hold on to and hope that one day your kingdom will come and your will be done. Lord of all hopefulness, hear our prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. We will sing our final hymn in a moment. 
number 547. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer, number 547. just through words but deeds through what you say what you do and who you are may others as they meet with you meet with Christ and know his living presence for themselves and now the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you all and remain with you forevermore